Uh, all right, so I am going to be talking today uh, about a specific collection called Honey and Hot Wax. And the idea of exploring the erotic in Honey and Hot Wax, which is a collection of erotic art games. So why study erotic games? Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about me. Um, in my bio, I talk a lot about my games work, but I'm a sociologist and my focus in sociology is sexuality. And my dissertation research focuses on purity culture in the United States. So I did a lot of work talking about how conservatives talk about sex. Um, and so I'm really interested in sexual discourse. And so for me, erotic games become another area for which we can understand sexual discourse, right? How we talk about sex, how we talk about sexuality, how we talk about the erotic, right? Game studies in itself tends to have an uneasy relationship with sexuality. And so it's a way to expand our understandings in games and game studies, but it's also a way to expand our understandings in terms of critical sexuality studies and seeing games as another site of meaning making about the topic of sex and sexuality. Games and sexuality have been studied in the past. Um, Ashley Brown, now Guajardo, uh, talks about different categories of sexy games. Uh, Guajardo and Stenros talk specifically about erotic role play, which is role play which invokes erotic, sensual, and sexual themes. Oh, good, it did show up. <clears throat> which brings me to Honey and Hot Wax. So Honey and Hot Wax is a collection of eight games. Um, it is a self-described collection of erotic art games. And this is the descriptive uh, explanation of these different games uh, using the sex is. So sex is exploring your partner's body like an adventurer in a surreal landscape, experimenting at a BDSM party in search of your perfect kink match, helping your lover reach new heights of pleasure with your vampire bite, a confusing yet exciting gossip topic for slumber parties, masturbating with balloons and talking about it in a chat room, not gay if it's with your bro, almost everything you do if you're hosting an alien symbiote, and difficult to describe using only a plate of sandwiches. So as you can see, this is a pretty wide collection of different games, different kinds of sexuality, different kinds of experiences. I was interested in studying this collection because it is so diverse in the way in which it conceptualizes sexuality. Uh, it is a collection that was made possible in part uh, by a grant from the Effing Foundation for Sex Positivity. So these are all games that take a sex positive um, attitude towards sexuality. And I was also particularly interested in the call for submissions. So all of these are analog games, which can be played wholly from the text. All of these games are playable and not just conceptual. All of these games focus in part on some aspect of sexuality as a central theme. And some of them involve sex acts as game mechanics, not merely as byproducts of play. And perhaps most important for me in terms of sexual discourse, the call for submissions states specifically that the editors are deliberately choosing not to explicitly define the term sex and sexuality and will instead be taking a broad view of the term. <clears throat> so one thing about studying games is figuring out how to make the study manageable, right? Uh, for me, it was interesting to study 
self-defined and selected erotic games. Past research has looked at a lot of player-defined erotic role play, right? So this is role play that takes place perhaps in a Dungeons and Dragons session, um, but that is involved in sensual and erotic content, right? So it's a player-defined category. I was interested in studying erotic games as a designer and editor defined category. Does that look different? How does that look different? Uh, nine different authors, eight different games create for me a bounded sample for study. This expansive definition of sex and sexuality allows for me to explore the meanings and really to interrogate sex and sexuality as socially constructed, right? That these aren't sort of biological terms, these aren't terms that are sort of static, uh, but they're terms that are open for interpretation, that are open for meaning making. And sort of a side note for me, uh, as someone coming out of the North American context, um, I was interested in erotic games that come from mostly outside of the Nordic context, right? There is a, a growing body of literature about the Nordic LARP tradition. Um, we've heard two papers that talk about Just a Little Lovin', and there's quite a bit of writing about particularly the sex mechanics within Just a Little Lovin' and how those are used to simulate sex and sexuality and play on the erotic in Just a Little Lovin'. Um, there's some writing and a scholarship that's been done on Arzamandi, which again came out of the Nordic LARP tradition and is another way of simulating sex and sensuality in games. So I was interested in looking at games that come from outside of this tradition um, and how are they looking at sex and sexuality. So my methods here are content analysis. Um, and I was interested in doing this literary ludic analysis which means that I'm reading the games as texts, but not only as texts, right? So I'm interested in not just the content and language, but also the mechanics, right? How are these creating this sort of container for gameplay? What is the gameplay going to look like? What is the sort of pre-game uh, framework that's being created? Uh, is there anything that's happening after the gameplay happens, right? so that I'm examining both the literary aspects of these games as well as the sort of game aspects of these games. Um, a sort of next phase that I'm hoping to uh, begin once I've done, finished my analysis of the games themselves is to do a content analysis of reviews of the collection. So it really got me thinking uh, about what's going on here is that I, I read some reviews uh, of this collection, uh, which were very sort of scandalized, um, which were very sort of uncomfortable with a lot of the games in the collection. Um, and so I was really interested in really delving in and finding out what is going on within these games. All right, so one of the things that came out of my con uh, content analysis was the themes of exploration discovery, and learning. Exploration was a core element of six of the eight games within the collection. This exploration took the form of exploring potentially new activities as well as different ways of being. Uh, this is new activities in terms of communicating about sex, this is new activities in terms of exploring different identities. Uh, this is new activities in terms of different types of sexual activities. And this idea of taking on characters that might be different from the player. This exploration and learning happened both in terms of the character and in terms of the player, right? So a lot of the theme of exploration took place within the game and the character that was being portrayed. Two of the games had scenes or phases of the game that were explicitly titled exploration scenes or exploration phases, right? These are core parts of the game. 
But exploration was also about the players themselves, right? This could take the form of kink exploration, different forms of sexuality. So these are two quotes uh, from different games. Players will be able to explore new activities and boundaries with their chosen partner while gaining communication skills that may benefit them in the future. This is from a game called Feeding Lucy, uh, which is about frank sexual communication uh, within the context of Dracula and Lucy. Um, the second quote, this game was created with the hope that it might teach all sorts of players to interact with literal and fictive anatomies simultaneously. And this is from a game called The Cleft in the Rocks, which is about engaging in sexual acts um, non-diegetically, while diegetically what's happening is an explorer is exploring a fantastical landscape. Another theme that came out of my analysis was the theme of communication. And this shows up again, both in terms of core themes of the particular games, as well as mechanics. So for Feeding Lucy and Pop, Pop is about lunars, people who get sexual arousal from balloons um, and talk about them in chat rooms. Um, communication becomes a core theme of both Feeding Lucy and Pop. Many of the games played with literal silences, that is particular parts of the game where players or characters are not allowed to speak. And other games had mechanical restrictions around communication. So for instance, Pass the Sugar Please is a game in which a group of people that have all attended a anonymous sex party are having tea and are using tea and sandwiches and cakes uh, to euphemistically talk about their experiences at this sex party without ever actually mentioning sex. Feeding Lucy, on the other hand, is all about frank sexual communication and practicing talking explicitly about desires and pleasure. The sleepover and you inside us focus on the process of learning to communicate desire and sexual interest um, in the context of a teenage sleepover party in ca the case of the sleepover and between a human host and an alien symbiote in the case of you inside us. And in the cleft of the rock emphasizes both very specific rules about the negotiation of touch. Again, this is the fantasy landscape exploration game, as well as the ways that bodies can be described during the game. Sex is awkward. <laughs> um, perhaps that is not a surprising finding, but I had this idea that erotic art games uh, were not gonna be so explicit about the fact that sex is awkward. Um, seven of the eight games mention the pot uh, potential for awkwardness, nervousness, or embarrassment during the game. Five of them specifically refer to the awkwardness experienced by the characters in the playing of the game. But three of the games, The Sleepover, Pop, and Feeding Lucy, discuss the awkwardness that players might feel while playing the game. In all three cases, players are assured that these feelings are natural, particularly given the subject matter. So in Pop, the quote is, sex is ridiculous with or without balloons. And in the case of Feeding Lucy, the quote is, don't be afraid to laugh or be silly, sex should be fun. And very important for me, as someone who studies the social construction of sexuality and gender, many of these games really highlighted non-normative definitions of sexuality, particularly in this focus on sex in the context of genitals and orgasms, right? So the emphasis of many of these games is expanding definitions of sex and sexuality beyond normative expectations. This includes kink uh, in terms of follow my lead, pass the sugar please, and pop. 
two of the games sort of explicitly interrogate queer identity, but I would argue that most of these games are queer. Um, six of the eight games have content that encourages players to think of sex beyond bodies, specific erogenous zones or orgasms. In the Cleft of the Rock specifies that players cannot describe bodies using human anat anatomical terms, but rather should describe these fantastical landscapes that are being explored. And Feeding Lucy and You Inside Us both include pre-game discussions about how to refer to the body parts being referred to during the game. All right. All of these games also do a lot of work in creating alibi and setting up a magic circle of play. There's been a lot of discussion already in the conference of this sort of creating this frame or this safer space um, for which role playing can be enacted. And particularly in games around sex and sexuality, uh, this setting the scene was very important. There was a lot of discussion of character, um, of recognizing when the boundary between character and player got fuzzy um, and when it needed to be uh, sort of thought of as a, a harder boundary. Uh, there were a lot of contexts and situations like a tea party after an anonymous sex party, a teenage sleepover, uh, alien symbiote, uh, which also sort of created this separate space from mundane reality. There was a lot of discussion in many of these games about specifically setting up a play space through music, um, set up rituals that were written into the games, the use of costumes, the use of props to create this space as separate from sort of mundane everyday life. And then of course, there was explicit discussions um, of consent and safety mechanics. The collection itself has a chapter uh, before you get to any of the games that focuses on consent and safety mechanics. And within the games themselves, they all have discussions of different consent and safety mechanics to be used throughout the game. Um, one of the things that I don't really have time to talk about in this short presentation, but I hope to sort of talk about uh, in the article, is the way in which uh, alibi and separation of player and character are really messy in these games, because many of them do talk about this idea of taking some of the skills, taking some of the ideas, taking some of the understandings gained through these games um, back from the game, right? So even though you're playing a character while you're playing the game, uh, you as the player are going to be able to take these experiences back with you or um, take this knowledge of how to communicate consent, how to negotiate with your partner, how to frankly communicate about your sexual desires um, into your everyday life. All right, so I want to take a moment to give a special thanks um, to Kayla Ramirez, who is my research assistant and has been amazingly helpful um, in going through these games with me. Again, I'm Catherine Casillo jones and if you have questions or would like to talk more, please feel free to come up to me during the conference, or here is my email. I'm also on the Discord, but thank you very much.